Well, uh, we uh, talked about this on Sunday, that we're going to start doing these weekly videos that give a little bit more uh, information about what we've been talking about. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in our notes that we don't get to get to uh, that are really good things. And so we decided to have like kind of like a midweek checkup where we come together and we share some of the other uh, themes and uh, things that come out in the text as we study them. And so last Sunday, we finished our series on the book of Ephesians. And uh, we specifically finished by talking about this idea of submission. Now, that's a really uh, difficult thing. We didn't actually go through Ephesians chapter by chapter. Instead, we went theme by theme. But whenever we got to submission, that's a difficult topic to talk about uh, because, well, we get to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, and it says, For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And then we get to 525, where it says, For husbands, this means to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Uh, that's not an easy passage. In fact, if we just read it and say, this is what is just talking about marriage, we actually kind of miss the point. It's not just about marriage. It's not just, that's not the core of it. In fact, that's just the indicator of what Paul is talking about. Actually talking about when he addresses submission, we actually have to see it through the scope of the entire book. And so the way that Paul builds this is he starts with this theme of our own spiritual condition. Uh, basically that we're dead spiritually without Christ. He points to where we are. And it's really amazing because he points to that, I think, so that we can understand where we came from, that we can understand what God has called us to by understanding what God has saved us from. He then goes in to talk about what Jesus has done for us. And that's basically chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians. Now, I love it, though, because as he builds that theme throughout chapters 1 through 3, and then chapter 4 comes around, and it's no longer saying what Christ has done for us. Instead, it's saying, now this is the church's response to what Christ has done. And so in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, therefore, and I'm going to stop right there, because anytime the Bible says therefore, you have to ask yourself, what's the therefore, therefore? And so what Paul has done is he said, okay, in the first three chapters, this is what Christ has done for us. And then he starts in 4.1 by saying, therefore. So whatever I just said, this to that. He says, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you calling, for you have been called by God. What he says is, as a reaction to everything I've been Life that's worthy of your calling, and then he reaffirms in them, for you have been called by God. You have been called by God, so live a life that's worthy of your calling, and then he goes into what that life looks like. In chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. What he says is, therefore, be unified. He says, therefore, be humble. Make, make allowances for each other's faults. Don't expect perfection out of each other. And then he says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. I don't know if you've ever seen someone make every effort, but it's usually not a very pretty thing. It's not uh, something that you would really want to take a picture of necessarily because using every effort, everything that you have is, is, is difficult. It's not pretty. And what Paul calls us to anyway says a life worthy of our calling looks like is us making every effort, not just small efforts to be unified, not just what would be socially acceptable but to make every effort, to fight with, for it, for everything that we have. Paul says it's that important, that it, that action to what Christ has done for us. To make because unity is important within the body. It doesn't happen without an individual commitment to selflessness. And, you know, that's, that's hard if you are a follower of Christ. If you haven't embraced the power of the that Paul's been talking about, 
God calls us to things all the time that we are to accomplish. And that's okay, because he calls us to accomplish these things, not as individuals, but he calls us to accomplish these things, but through the power of and the power of his spirit at work within us. We are called to that level of unity because it's through that level of unity that we actually church. But then Paul continues, because then if we jump from the call to unity and the power of the spirit, if we jump straight from that into our marriages, we still miss the point, the core issue, which is selflessness. An individual commitment to selflessness. That's why in 521, Paul says, but let me get to it, sorry. <laughs> in 521, Paul says, Commit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's the verse right before it says, Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. He says, Submit to each other. And this isn't a call for wives. This isn't a call for husbands. It is, but it's not just that. It's not just a call for widows. It's not just a call for children. It's actually a call for every person in the church across the board, not just the church in Ephesus, but the church across time, across the, across the globe. We're called to submit to each other, to subject ourselves to ourselves and intentionally place ourselves beneath each other. And then Paul says, this is what that looks like in the marriage. This is what that looks like in relationships. This is what that looks like with children. This is what it looks like across the board. And that's where it leads to Wives, submit to your husbands. That's what this means. And then husbands, give yourselves up for your wives. It's a call for mutual submission, mutual subjection, and mutual sacrifice. He goes into this is that looks for the entire church. And then he finishes that. That's where we finished last week. But then he finishes by pushing it to the next level, which says this. A final word. Now, anytime uh, a, a scripture says a final word or the final address or anything like that, that's really when the audience kind of leans in a little bit because that's the part to where Paul brings out the big guns, what he's really talking about. He says, and the final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the powers in this dark world and spirits in the heavenly world. Paul gives a call to the he gives a call to unity so hard that he says, make every effort to be unified. Because if you're not unified, if you're not submitting to each other, if you're not approaching it from a position of selflessness, you're going to fall victim to one of the greatest handicaps the church can experience. And that handicap is distraction. If we don't embrace the unity that comes from the individual commitment to then we get up on small things or we get caught up, we get distracted by small things. And we forget that we're in a battle. What Paul says is, you guys need to focus on selflessness. You need to focus on submitting to each other and subjecting yourselves to each other because you are in the middle of a battle. And you have to realize that because it's not a battle that you can see. It's a battle that is unseen, but we're still in it. We're called to the selflessness that brings us into this battle prepared. And Paul continues that. He says, you are in this battle against unseen spirits in the heavenly places. And then in chapter 6, verse 13, it says, therefore, there's another therefore. So because we are in this battle, we need to put on every piece of God's armor so that we will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil, then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. Stand your ground. And then it goes through what the armor of God actually looks like. It says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Uh, that belt of truth, that's like that's the belt of sound doctrine, basically. It's what we believe. Uh, put on the belt of truth, objective biblical truth, and the body armor of God's righteousness. So he starts out right there saying, 
to really be successful in this, you need to put on the the armor of God's righteousness. And I love that because it means that we're putting on something that's not ours. We're putting on the armor of God's righteousness. Meaning we're not righteous, but because of God's grace and his love, we get to put on his righteousness as uh, as armor in the battle against evil things that we can't see. It says for shoes in chapter uh, sorry in chapter six verse fifteen it says for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news. Put on the peace that comes from the good news. The good news that we are at peace with God. The good news that we are wearing His righteousness, not our own. That we can have a relationship with God, and that brings us to a level of peace. Put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. And then He says, and in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil, and then put on salvation as your helmet, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But Paul says selflessness so that you can realize that you are in a battle and in stepping into this battle, these are the things that protect you. And I like at the end that it does talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, it's really interesting for me to hold up this, this Bible and say, like, this is the sword of the Spirit. But the truth is, is that this is ink. The sword of the Spirit is when you take these words that are on the page and you implant them into your heart. That's when it becomes the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's when it becomes effective. That's when it becomes useful in the battle. So Paul calls us to selflessness. He calls us to re- He shows us the armor that God has prepared for us so that we can be ready and prepared for this battle. And then he finishes in 6.18 by saying, Pray in the Spirit at all times. On every occasion, stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. What I get from these passages is that Paul is basically saying that we are going to be called to something that is beyond our ability. God does that often. He calls us to things that we just can't do on our own. And there's a popular thing out there that says, you know, God won't give us more than we can handle. But the truth is, is he does that all the time. The truth is, is that God will give us more than we, than we can handle. But he will walk with us through it. And in this, Paul tells us into a battle that we are not prepared for. But that God is willing to prepare us for this. He's willing to walk beside us in this. And one of the ways he does that is by giving us the church that we can be unified together and that we can... This next week, we're going to be diving into a series. It's the first week in our series called Selah, where we'll be diving in and talking about what the worship of the church looks like. Um, We're going to be coming back again next Wednesday to talk about a little deeper into what that looks like as well. Uh, But really... For today, the big thought is this. Embrace the idea of putting yourself last through the power of the Spirit. You can't do it on your own. To each other so that we can be the church. Be the kind of person that is willing to go through the hard times, the confrontations, uh, to fight for unity with everything that you possess about getting through unity or you care more about arriving at true peace and unity than you do about just avoiding and when we do that we will have an understanding that we are in the middle of the battle and then together we can help each other put on the armor of God I hope you have a great Wednesday we'll see you on Sunday